When you live in a foreign city, it's quite a liberating experience in that you find yourself daring to do things that you perhaps never would. A Town Like Paris is a book that I've written. It's the story of my life here in Paris. I had come here with images of Hemingway's movable feast in my head. I was going to take my seat at that feast and I was going to tuck in. I kind of fumbled my way through the French cultural maze and fumbled my way through the French dating scene. Set up a rock band, appeared on French game shows and then all of a sudden I met a Parisian showgirl, a dancer at the Lido de Paris. And I had experienced a side of Paris that didn't resemble that which I had seen in other books before. The Paris that I came to know, it was picture postcard and it was beautiful, but there was also a seedy underbelly, I guess. I was determined to show people that there was a flip side to, to the Paris that most people know and love. Three years into my Paris sojourn, I decided it was time to invest in a Vespa. And it is the most wonderful, liberating experience. Being afforded glimpses of, of, of Paris's beauty from, from a vantage point that I guess not many people see. We're in the Marais, which is where a great deal of the book is set. Well, the wonderful thing about the Marais is that you get uh, all sorts of cultures living cheek by jowl. You have the gay community. You have, oh, and there's some of them now. <laughs> You have the gay community, as I was saying. There's also uh, the Jewish community. You've got young families who have moved in and urban professionals. It's a wonderful mix. And it's relatively unknown. The French are very dramatic people. Uh, you will see people you know, having arguments or being engaged in affectionate embraces uh, in very public places. And you know, for me, that was quite a shock. You are a foreigner in a foreign city, and that occasionally means that you come up against cultural idiosyncrasies that you don't quite understand. But then you walk out your door and you're on the streets of Paris and the city starts to enchant you all over again. It took me, I would say, maybe three years of living in France before I discovered one of the key rules was that you had to endure two no's to any request you made before you received a yes. So that was everything from asking for a train ticket or uh, trying to get your papers processed or or even, you know, convincing a French woman to come out on a date with you. I was living the wild, swinging bachelor days, and then all of a sudden, my path crossed that of a, of a Lido dancer. When I first met Bryce, I was, <laughs> I was intrigued as, as to this funny little man that <laughs> was so bold. He pretended that he wanted to do a story about Australian dancers at the Lido. I don't think I made much of an impact on her, <laughs> but I persisted. Some would say I stalked her, but that would be an unfair reading of the situation. And uh, finally uh, won her heart. It was also a fascinating entree into what is a most remarkable, surreal world. When you go uh, backstage at the Lido, it's, uh, it's a scene of barely constrained chaos. You have uh, semi-naked dancers running from one side of the stage to the other. You have dressers frantically dressing dancers before they go on stage. And uh, for me to go to see that show and uh, and to see my girlfriend dancing up on stage. I used to sit there and just pinch myself and wonder how it had all come to pass. I found myself falling in love in the City of Light and um, discovering in the process that what I had come here to Paris to look for was a lot closer to home than I expected it was going to be.